I'll give you the uh, sort of basic uh, uh, overview. I'm going to be taking you on a tour of uh, what's been going on with uh, uh, intercity passenger rail developments, both uh, close to home here in California. Um, before that, uh, some efforts and experiments uh, in the US and uh, the rest of the world and how these uh, all sort of uh, come to a head, uh, I think, uh, in the medium uh, term. California is definitely uh, uh, the place to be if you want to uh, see what the new formula or new model railroad, as I've called it, uh, for uh, North American passenger service might uh, look like. Uh, uh, whether uh, you like it or not, um, and I think most of you like it, but maybe some don't, California is uh, the, uh, the innovator, the laboratory, um, and you're experimenting with uh, uh, trying to make passenger trains have a, a brighter future. So um, let's see where we've been. Um, the U.S. Uh, has had a, a record, uh, a pretty good uh, track record. Hmm. Where should Screen, okay, let's see. Yes, there we go. So um, the U.S. has had a pretty good record of adopting transportation technologies uh, uh, that have been invented uh, elsewhere. Uh, uh, two major technologies, uh, uh, well, three really. Uh, this, the motorized uh, steam engine, um, which you see here, uh, the uh, automobile and the jet aircraft were all invented outside of the United States, but yet the U.S. is known for making uh, quick use of these. Uh, so here you see recreations of the first uh, uh, modern, recognizably modern rail um, uh, operation. The Liverpool and Manchester uh, railway is on the left there. Again, a recreation of that and a recreation within one year of that going into service. Uh, the Baltimore and Ohio was operating essentially the same technology, essentially the same type of uh, service on the east coast of, uh, of this continent. So the first um, uh, sort of time period for uh, adopting uh, foreign uh, technology to our transportation system in a big way was exactly one year, which is pretty good when you think about it, uh, especially uh, in the 19th century, early 19th century, how long it took to get uh, things across the Atlantic. And I think Americans have been eager and uh, quick to embrace new technology and new opportunities in mobility because uh, in this country, even more than most, uh, the association between physical mobility and social mobility has been uh, uh, widely accepted and embraced. Uh, the idea that uh, uh, tomorrow uh, will be better uh, for more people if they have more options and more choices on how to get around um, was borne out for uh, a couple of centuries uh, in this country. And of course, uh, this part of uh, the West Coast uh, um, was uh, built and uh, expanded over those uh, uh, years because of new transportation uh, options, whether it was rail or uh, ships uh, uh, getting uh, the first uh, settlers here. Um, as you can see from this uh, book uh, illustration from the 1940s, when people thought about the future, um, they thought about more and different uh, modes of mobility being added uh, to the mix, whether it was uh, uh, streamlined uh, rail, uh, elevated uh, uh, expressways, helicopters, or even uh, space travel. I'm going to need the laser pointer, so I might as well check if it's working. Let's see if that does it. Mm. Uh, I'll get it eventually. Anyway, um, so uh, the automobile. Uh, as we know it, was invented in Germany, um, and the jet aircraft also uh, in a different Germany, uh, one that wasn't particularly friendly to the U.S. Uh, at the time. But uh, uh, the U.S. Uh, was quite quick to uh, embrace and adapt these technologies, even more than the, the steam uh, locomotive. Where the U.S. has excelled in taking transportation technology to the next level has been turning existing inventions that were designed for very specialized purposes, like fighter aircraft or uh, a horseless carriage for rich people, and turning those into mass transportation, again, based on that principle that uh, uh, more physical mobility will help uh, social mobility and uh, create opportunities for uh, people throughout the country. And uh, Henry Ford 
said lots of things which I probably wouldn't agree with, but I certainly agree with, uh, with this quote that, uh, that he put forward when people asked him about his role in innovating uh, the uh, automobile mass production system. That really uh, what, uh, what he excelled at and what I think the American um, uh, approach to transportation innovation has been to assemble the discoveries of others um, and make progress with them when the factors are ready um, to uh, put those into place. Um, and whether it's uh, uh, low-cost uh, air travel or using automobiles as a form of uh, mass transportation in this country, the U.S. has led uh, the world. And even in uh, aerospace travel as, uh, as well. So when we have this curve of uh, adoption, we see that the U.S. has been an early adopter, uh, whether it was the 19th century trains, uh, automobiles, uh, aerospace, uh, uh, but uh, what I would call modern passenger rail, the sort of late 20th century and 21st century reincarnation of passenger rail, we are, uh, whether we like it or not, uh, a laggard in that area. That's kind of a, an outlier that I think needs some attention. We need to know why it is that, you know, this tendency that Americans have had for generations before to sort of adopt and adapt transportation technology to uh, make a better tomorrow just didn't happen when it came to figuring out how to build uh, better, better trains. So at first it looked possible that this uh, pattern would continue. This is the inauguration of the uh, Tokaido Shinkansen, the famous Japanese bullet train, which will be coming up to its 50th anniversary uh, in October. I'm pretty sure it'll make the news, uh, at least uh, back pages of the news uh, uh, paper. Um, in Japan, it'll probably be a big deal. Um, uh, it was uh, 1964. I believe they had an Olympics uh, in uh, Japan, and this was uh, uh, inaugurated. Um, and it caught people's uh, attention in this country and others around the world. And within one year, again, we have that one year time lag, uh, President Johnson, uh, the last president before the current one to really uh, have a, a sort of a, a, a passion or at least a high priority for figuring out uh, uh, better modern passenger trains at a national level, signed the High Speed Ground Transportation Act of 1965. Um, that appropriated $60 million, which I didn't do the math, but is uh, a lot more today for in today's dollars, for demonstration for technology R&D and for demonstration projects um, to show what would be possible with uh, bringing high-speed uh, passenger trains and maybe reversing some of the challenges that the uh, rail industry was having in the mid-1960s, particularly around passenger, but even, even freight. Well, it didn't turn out to be a, a high-speed route uh, to uh, implementing that uh, vision and uh, program of the High Speed Ground Transportation Act. Um, the uh, only record, really, that the U.S. Uh, uh, holds when it comes to high speed is the longest uh, elapsed time between proposing uh, bringing high-speed rails uh, to passenger service and actually uh, deploying it. Um, we've passed nine presidents and 24 sessions of Congress, but we, uh, we can learn from uh, the, uh, that uh, long, slow march uh, forward, or I think we should try to uh, anyway. We need to think carefully about what happened during those uh, 50 years, both here and uh, abroad. So let's begin by looking at what happened here. We uh, did quickly build uh, a train that could go very fast. And this looks uh, a bit like uh, a cartoon type uh, contraption. You'd see uh, uh, Wile E. Coyote uh, uh, piloting. But um, it's still, this piece of uh, rail equipment actually currently is still the speed record holder in North America. It was set on July 23rd, 1966 in Bryan, Ohio, of all places, a, a state that sent back their, their public uh, stimulus money for higher speed passenger rail a few years back. Uh, I doubt the people who made those decisions even had a clue that their, their state is the uh, place currently that has the speed record for uh, this. This was a, a prototype. Uh, it was just made to test the idea that you actually could get a train going this fast on this continent, uh, sort of like the, the Shinkansen. Uh, they took a surplus jet engine from a B-47, welded it to the top of uh, a, a self-propelled uh, RDC car, and uh, the people who uh, piloted or drove that um, took a, a, a lot of uh, risk to do that test because half of that car was filled with jet fuel and uh, to make that engine work. And if something would have gone wrong, 
no one would have walked away from that uh, uh, situation. So it was uh, a, a bit of a risk, uh, um, and, and uh, it did show that if you uh, spiked down every switch, uh, closed every grade crossing uh, for 100 miles, and uh, put a jet engine on the train, you could get it going uh, quite quickly. But this was um, enough to catch the attention of the aerospace industry. And um, there was something that came out of this, the uh, turbo train, which was built by United Aircraft, which uh, uh, was Sikorsky. And I think it's now part of Lockheed Martin. They've sort of merged and expanded over the years. But the aerospace industry um, found a, a more uh, uh, appropriate way to put a, a, a jet turbine inside the uh, locomotive, uh, not strapped to the roof. Um, and um, uh, this train, the, uh, the turbo train, actually was uh, uh, operational between New York and Boston between uh, 1968 and 1976. It uh, reached uh, test speeds of 170 miles an hour on the Northeast uh, rail tracks. Um, and its schedule uh, between New York and Boston during those years when it made the, the schedule, which wasn't always, um, but when it was uh, there, it was the same speed uh, schedule as the current uh, uh, fastest train in uh, North America, the Amtrak uh, Acela. So this uh, did show that you could get uh, the aerospace industry involved in building and designing a train that could go uh, quickly using, uh, uh, you know, sort of modern uh, technology in production. The other uh, part of this demonstration program was a partnership for an electric high-speed train, which would be more similar to the Shinkansen, um, and is the sort of grandparent, maybe, of the uh, Acela of uh, today, or one of the uh, uh, descendants. This was the uh, Metroliner, and this was a partnership uh, between the uh, uh, four big companies whose logos are at the bottom, two of which are still around today, the ones that didn't specialize only in rail, uh, GE and Westinghouse, and uh, a rail uh, uh, company, the Pennsylvania Railroad, and the Bud Company, which was the builder of a lot of uh, uh, classic uh, passenger train equipment uh, in the 20, late, mid, mid 20th century. Um, they got together and uh, showed that you could build uh, an electric train that could go around 120 miles, 125 miles an hour on good days uh, uh, in regular service. And this um, was also put into service on the part of the Northeast uh, Corridor, New York to Washington, that w had electric uh, uh, traction in place. And it offered a three-hour trip from New York to, uh, to Washington, which was uh, a commercial success story. The, uh, the Metroliner and its you know, progeny, the Acela today, are the one um, uh, part of the uh, passenger rail system in North America that is consistently able to cover its, uh, its costs. It showed that you could um, do that, and back in the day, uh, there was uh, a poster there that uh, Amtrak could actually boast that it ran one of the fastest passenger trains uh, in the world. This would have been about 19... 72 or 73, um, and uh, uh, we can't say that uh, anymore, but that was sort of the, the high point of this demonstration program, the uh, Acela and the Metroliner. Uh, meanwhile, other places that didn't uh, get in on this uh, first round of development and, and uh, saw challenges, which we'll get to in a minute, uh, uh, in the rail industry, wound up uh, taking different approaches once Amtrak was uh, put in uh, place. California was uh, probably the, uh, the biggest uh, proponent or active state in uh, trying a more simplified uh, approach, not trying to beat uh, the Japanese speed records, but um, to develop uh, simpler uh, versions of intercity uh, passenger rail. And Amtrak California um, was a, a work in progress uh, that uh, has taken that path uh, further than any other part of the U.S. Uh, uh, has. So California has invested more and more in, uh, in its network, uh, which is uh, illustrated here. And, um, well, you can see Santa Cruz. I can't seem to get the laser pointer going. Um, maybe this? No. Yeah. It's, we're here uh, right now. And um, uh, the uh, uh, Amtrak uh, services go down the Central Valley as well as uh, the coast. But where um, Amtrak uh, California really developed uh, some innovation was uh, in 
uh, intermodal uh, uh, connections, uh, which you have here as well. The idea that you could connect up and extend trains uh, that ran uh, in these corridors uh, to communities like uh, Santa Cruz um, by uh, dedicated bus connections that met the trains through tickets, guaranteed uh, uh, meeting, uh, was uh, an innovation uh, and showed that it wasn't all or nothing. You didn't have to have train versus road. Uh, you could get uh, things working uh, together. Um, so that built uh, the market uh, for more in California. and. Um, And some of those buses uh, go to uh, other more tourist type uh, train uh, operations. In Northern California, you have uh, the uh, uh, skunk train up in Willits in Napa Valley. Uh, couldn't get a picture of the Napa wine train with the Amtrak bus next to it, but you can connect uh, those up. And um, I guess people could take uh, the number 17 flyer bus, uh, thank you, down, down the uh, highway here to uh, ride some of your special train trips uh, as, uh, as well. So California developed uh, really the second largest market for uh, Amtrak outside of the Northeast through these uh, steps, small steps, but a lot of them uh, over time. And uh, Amtrak had the Northeast uh, legacy of that sort of infrastructure and uh, technology demonstration program. But they didn't quite reach the critical mass yet of uh, what was going on in other parts of the world. And uh, when you think about what was missing from the ingredient, we, we showed that we could build fast trains, very fast trains. Uh, we showed that we could build uh, good connected service networks uh, to serve uh, corridors and markets between 100 and 250, 300 miles. Um, but the tracks were the uh, limiting uh, uh, factor, I think, um, that uh, to take America's passenger trains to places that uh, they've gone in other parts of the world now in Asia and in Europe, um, the tracks have to be uh, decongested uh, in places where they're too crowded or upgraded, as you might uh, think of doing uh, here, where you've got um, uh, a long legacy of uh, sort of slow speed uh, limited uh, uh, freight operations. Uh, when it's come time, to, whether it's been uh, the uh, turbo train, the Metroliner, or the Acela, um, those high-speed trains have never been able to reach their design potential uh, because of the tracks that they operate uh, uh, over. Um, and when you get out uh, uh, into the longer haul um, systems, excuse me, the longer haul uh, parts of the Amtrak system, and even some of the corridors here, there's a real congestion problem where uh, there just isn't the capacity in a growing economy to um, uh, move all the freight that those uh, class one railroads want to keep going across the, the continent and fit the passenger trains uh, in so they usually wind up uh, getting delayed and taking the, uh, the side track. So the trick, uh, I think, for us to think carefully uh, about American experience and uh, challenges is uh, uh, how to figure out how to build um, the infrastructure or rebuild the infrastructure in some places that would be needed, whether it's for very high speed trains or even more conventional uh, train service. And we have to recognize that the US doesn't have a lot of experience uh, at a public sector level um, in building or rebuilding um, rail infrastructure. The last time the US national government got into building uh, uh, rail infrastructure, it did it sort of as a silent partner. This is a map of the areas of the U.S. where land grants were given out to the uh, private railroads, uh, the uh, Central Pacific, Southern Pacific, Union Pacific, uh, and um, you can see large sections of California. That's not all the land in those sections that was given away, but those are the zones where large amounts of land were, uh, were transferred, and that was a one-time um, gift, if you will, uh, although uh, the railroads would say that they earned it by developing the infrastructure and by offering special rates for uh, mail and military transportation and uh, public uh, use of the tracks. Um, that gets to be quite contentious. But the point, I guess, is that it's been over a century since that model was used, and it was a one-shot wonder. You, know, you can only give the land away once, uh, pretty much, uh, once you've given it. That's it. Um, and uh, the railroads um, uh, 
uh, have a bit of a, a, a legacy uh, uh, baggage, shall we say, from that uh, period. That's a cartoon from um, the uh, Gilded Age of the, the robber barons. Um, when uh, railroads uh, had, once you got away from uh, navigable water in the United States along those corridors, they had a monopoly. Uh, and uh, railroads, uh, uh, you know, got uh, a bit um, uh, high and mighty in that uh, monopoly, and lots of farmers and others uh, felt that they were being taken advantage of, and uh, uh, railroads also, uh, uh, in this state and others, had uh, a bit of a corrupting influence on uh, politics uh, to keep those uh, privileges uh, going. Um, eventually, like any uh, sort of overreaching uh, uh, of those sorts of things, uh, there was a reaction, and some might say an overreaction, um, of federal regulation. Uh, the railroad industry was the first um, industry, national industry in the United States, to be heavily regulated, uh, uh, and uh, that happened for a reason. It, they didn't just, wasn't random that they got picked out. They had that monopoly, um, and that was sort of a backlash, uh, which cost them uh, a lot uh, uh, over time. And there still is a legacy uh, from that. Uh, you know, uh, um, it's a legacy in the English language. Uh, we're the only uh, uh, language uh, where the uh, idiom uh, railroad is used as a verb, which is uh, synonymous to take advantage of, uh, of someone. If you go to Europe or China and say, you know, talk about being railroaded, they won't understand that use of the, the term. So that's from this part of that baggage that came out of the, uh, the 19th century approach. And the relationship between governments and railroads have never exactly been the same. So even now, when you're trying to negotiate it, I guess it, I heard it took 20 years to get your tracks back from the uh, Union Pacific. Uh, you know, there was some of that uh, going on behind the, uh, the scenes. Uh, there's still that sort of adversarial legacy uh, in place. And that's uh, something that needs to be fixed. And if you don't uh, go beyond that and come up with a, a different model, um, maybe one that can learn lessons from uh, where the U.S. went in terms of developing the rest of its transportation infrastructure, um, you're not going to get as far. So when it came time to get beyond that rail monopoly, besides regulating the railroads to get them to stop misbehaving, when it came time to build uh, roads and other facilities, the U.S. took a different uh, approach than uh, land grants or one-time uh, transfers of uh, subsidies for private uh, infrastructure. Um, when it came to the uh, air and road uh, networks, it was uh, a public investment uh, model that was brought forward. The U.S., uh, uh, some people don't like the term, but I, the U.S. has been very much of a road socialist uh, uh, infrastructure policy when it comes to uh, the uh, the rest of its transportation system. And this was a partnership that came out between levels of government, between uh, Washington, D.C. and states, and then local governments as well. It started in 1916. That was the first federal aid uh, uh, highway act that was uh, put in place. And it was an ongoing commitment to planning and financing these facilities jointly um, uh, and keeping them in the uh, the public sector. And the interstate highway system was sort of the, the highest uh, uh, infrastructure uh, uh, outcome of that. And again, um, governments, states, which usually fight with each other, found ways to work together um, to coordinate a national network of over 40,000 miles of, uh, of these uh, in ways that uh, California and uh, Oregon and Nevada just uh, have real trouble thinking about when it comes to passenger rail, if it makes sense to cross state boundaries. Uh, that model was extended to uh, uh, regional airport development, uh, regional public transit uh, development, basically everything except for the rail infrastructure in this country um, was uh, done uh, through this public uh, partnership between different levels of government and um, uh, has worked uh, reasonably well. Um, maybe it's not perfect and maybe one can do better, but uh, one has to recognize that there's lessons to be learned from this. The rail industry um, uh, learned some lessons, too, uh, that competing against publicly funded infrastructure, um, when they were heavily regulated from their robber baron uh, days, uh, was getting harder and harder. And by the 1970s, uh, the U.S. rail industry was heading uh, into bankruptcy. In uh, the largest bankruptcy at the time in the United States, it would be uh, dwarfed by some of the more recent ones, but at the time was the Penn Central, which was the biggest railroad on the northeast part and the midwest part of the U.S. That spun off 
Conrail and Amtrak and led to a reinvention of the freight business and uh, preservation, let's say, of the, uh, the passenger side. And one of the reasons that reinvention happened with freight um, is because there was deregulation. Once uh, government uh, realized that uh, the rail industry was not working and uh, that it was on the hook for big uh, subsidies uh, for both Amtrak and even bigger ones at first for Conrail, there was a move, a uh, more open-minded uh, approach to letting the railroads invent their own future. And once deregulation came in in 1980, the freight railroads really changed their business model um, quite substantially. Before, they used to be a universal mode of transportation, carrying everything from the milk to individual parcels that you could go down to the station, much the way you would uh, uh, send something by FedEx or UPS today. Um, commuter rail, uh, all different kinds of passenger rail, that was left behind. Um, the approach for the uh, reinvention of the freight uh, uh, business in the United States was niche markets. Um, uh, heavy haul bulk uh, resources uh, was the beginning of that reinvention, and then containerized uh, freight uh, moving long distances uh, supplemented it, and uh, railroads are no longer trying to be all things to all people, and they've uh, uh, really focused uh, in on that, which has implications for their tracks and their infrastructure. First thing is you need a lot fewer tracks uh, if you're not trying to be a universal mode of transportation. So lots of tracks have gone away in uh, the U.S. Uh, rail network uh, since the 1980s, um, and uh, single track lines have been uh, kept where there used to be double track or sometimes triple track has gone to double. Most railroads have found ways to slim down their, uh, their infrastructure. And uh, as you're doing here, uh, other places have uh, taken rails and turned them over to, uh, to trails. There's 20,000 miles of rail rights of way that have been turned strictly into trails, although if you, uh, those people read the very fine print in those agreements, it does say that those trails can be reactivated and turned back into rails. No one's had the political uh, uh, guts to try that yet uh, in the United States, and I think it's going to be very difficult if you do turn a rail right-of-way into a trail just because you have the legal possibility of reactivating it. I'm not sure that it's likely that you'd be able to do that. So those are big changes from, and subtractions from the national rail infrastructure, and then places like uh, Monterey Bay uh, here, um, many short lines were created and developed, uh, some of them barely able to get over tracks that were uh, overgrown uh, along the way. That looks a lot worse than what you've got on the left here. Um, and uh, the, the major railroads transferred tracks, uh, sometimes directly to the private sector, sometimes through public uh, agencies like uh, the one here. Um, and uh, those short lines took niches, usually specialized uh, uh, markets uh, in those regions and operated uh, over them. So we had a real dismantling of the, uh, the, f of, uh, the rail network, which used to sort of go everywhere and do everything. And that changed the way the infrastructure was used, but it also changed the economics. I mean, one thing we have to be proud of uh, in this country uh, is that we've come up with a, a freight rail system that uh, is uh, an economic success story. In fact, if you stop and think about it, the freight rail uh, operators in this country are the only mode of transportation that's been consistently able to make money since 2001. Think about the auto industry bankruptcies, think about the airline bankruptcies, now the highway trust fund is pretty much bankrupt in this country. During that time, um, you, you have to give credit to the freight railroads. They've been able to cover their costs and reinvest billions into their freight infrastructure. So that is a success story that we have uh, on uh, our plus side uh, during that period while the rest of the world was inventing uh, higher speed passenger trains. And, and the people who are sort of into money uh, pay attention uh, to this. Uh, you know, um, uh, Warren Buffett owns the, uh, uh, one of the big Western railroads entirely, the BNSF, and Bill Gates is, uh, uh, at one point he was the single largest investor in Canadian National. He's certainly one of the big owners of stock in, in that company. Um, if you uh, want to make money, uh, uh, the old joke in the airline business is if you want to make a small fortune in the airlines, you should start with a large fortune um, and you'll get there fast. Um, in uh, railroads, it's the opposite. People with large fortunes who want to make even larger ones are investing in that infrastructure because it's a success story. But uh, what that model took us down a different path 
than where Asia and Europe were going in building high-speed uh, rail lines of ex extended uh, length and scope. So let's take a look briefly at where they went. Uh, there's sort of three different paths that have evolved in the 50 years. So there's more than one model that works um, in different places for building high-speed rail. And uh, uh, there's three that evolved more or less in chronological order. Uh, the exclusive corridor, uh, the hybrid network, and then the comprehensive national uh, uh, network. And each one became more ambitious in its own way of what high-speed rail could do. When it started out, um, the high-speed rail was running just between Tokyo and uh, Osaka in Japan. So just between here and here. Um, but uh, uh, then, uh, Japan is a fairly linear uh, country with population concentrated on the main island, although they are eventually going to extend it through a tunnel up to their north island uh, as well. But basically, it's uh, a dedicated, single-purpose, high-speed rail track uh, that uh, runs uh, the length and uh, of the country and is very, actually, um, it's the safest mode of transportation. There's been zero, I repeat, zero fatalities on the Japanese uh, high-speed rail system since 1964. That's a unique record, and uh, there's a reason for it, because all the trains run at the same speed. Uh, you know, uh, uh, it's very easy to keep everything running safely. If everything's running at the same speed, they can run them three to five minutes apart, uh, and they don't get in each other's way. Um, it's very different in uh, uh, countries like North America, where you're mixing slower freight trains and trying to squeeze faster passenger trains around them. Um, there's reasons why the risks uh, of that uh, are, uh, are higher, and there's reasons why the Japanese decided they had the volume of passengers uh, to just have a, a, another layer of passenger rail operation on top of their freight. Uh, they don't have much freight on rail anyway. Um, local commuter service is on separate, totally separate tracks. So that dedicated corridor, at first, uh, that's what people took away from the Japanese success story. They said, well, you can only build high-speed rail in places where you have cities of 10 million people, um, and they line up you know, every two to 300 miles. That's uh, uh, really not what happens in other places, even, uh, even other parts of Asia or Europe, uh, let alone North America. So the people who were skeptical about this first model being introduced into North America had some some justification by saying this really is a different geography and uh, mobility markets. But the second model uh, that the French and then the Germans uh, uh, adapted, this is a map of Germany, but there's similar, you could look at France somewhat similar and other parts of Europe as well, is called a, a hybrid network where you, uh, they developed trains that could run both on high speed trunk lines, those red sections are the sort of bullet train equivalent speeds, uh, over 150 miles an hour, and uh, it doesn't show all of the conventional rail branches and networks that they can get onto, but those trains are able to run uh, to many cities in Germany that don't uh, uh, have much uh, of the new high-speed rail infrastructure by sharing the tracks that already exist. And uh, France also uh, built its high-speed uh, TGV network initially between Paris and Lyon, but then other sections where they would run partly on the high-speed tracks and partly on existing infrastructure that was there. So this, this blending allowed for uh, a much cheaper uh, relative to just all bullet train from end to end uh, infrastructure. It allowed for blending of services. You could mix and match. Uh, there you see on the right the, uh, the high speed coming on its own trunk line at full, you know, 160, 170 mile an hour speed. And on the left, it's coming into a, a junction city station where there's a commuter train uh, right next to it. And of course, when the two trains arrive, uh, they'll have transfers uh, for people who are going to local destinations. Uh, it'll be convenient to connect between them. Um, so that is the blended model that uh, the Europeans um, took and are now actually scaling it to a continental model. They're trying to connect up the high-speed rail systems of northern Europe in France and Germany with the southern ones in Spain and Italy um, by building some linked uh, connections, uh, but again, blending and using existing infrastructure in parts so that you will have a network that goes all the way from Denmark in the north to uh, uh, Naples uh, in the south. 
Does that mean people are going to take a high-speed train from uh, Copenhagen to Naples? Probably not, just like you can uh, take uh, Interstate 80 from the Bay Area to uh, the New York uh, metropolitan area. Doesn't mean that most people do that. The, the average trip length on the interstate uh, highway uh, system, by the way, is under 200 miles. So you know that, that uh, same logic could apply uh, to the European high-speed rail network. It will cover thousands of miles but most people will use particular segments of it for a couple of hour trips. And then we've got the third uh, iteration uh, of uh, high-speed rail model, uh, modeling, if you will, and that's the, uh, the Chinese who are thinking very big. Um, they are building the world's, uh, well, they already have the world's largest um, in terms of length. They have more high-speed rail uh, miles or kilometers in place than all the rest of the world systems put together, and they're aiming for um, uh, even more uh, to come. Um, they're running the longest uh, high-speed rail uh, uh, services. Uh, right now, uh, just in, in the last uh, year, there's been the inauguration of the Be Beijing to Guangzhou, which used to be called Canton in the south. That's an eight-hour trip. It's about the same distance as Seattle to San Diego, and when I looked it up uh, on the schedule, with a connection or two, it's 35 hours uh, on, uh, on Amtrak. So that just gives you a sense. They are um, looking, now you might think eight hours on a train to go over a thousand miles is still uh, a long time. But uh, in China, where you have a rapidly developing uh, economy, it's just great uh, compared to spending. They also used to have trains that took 35 hours and you had to sleep overnight and then spend part of the next day. So it's uh, a real boon. And what the Chinese have realized, uh, for reasons that uh, we could talk about in questions, climate and energy uh, issues going forward, they want uh, a transportation system that can move the majority of their population around their country without oil, uh, because these uh, electric trains run on uh, various energy sources, uh, some that we don't like, like coal uh, or nuclear, but uh, China's also building a lot of solar uh, capacity out there. So they have a, an open-ended energy system to move their domestic population for you know, fairly long distance uh, trips, certainly ones that could fit both coasts of the U.S. and the Midwest, uh, maybe not uh, end to end, although this morning I was talking, I didn't uh, include the slides here. The Chinese, I don't know if you caught last week, are talking about uh, 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 an Asia to North America uh, rail plan that would take them uh, through a Bering uh, Tunnel, which is only three times longer than the Channel Tunnel between uh, France and uh, the U.K., um, they have the money and the engineering ability to do this, believe me. They also have the ability to build trains, uh, high-speed trains, uh, it would take about two days to make that uh, uh, trip. When you think, uh, those of you who may have flown Trans-Pacific, when you think about it, how much slower is that really from what uh, you experience? You probably spend a day with all of the travel involvement and then a day trying to recover from that kind of an experience. If you had a two-day train uh, trip where you had a little bed to sleep in uh, along the way, it may not actually be that much slower to get from you know, the Bay Area to Beijing uh, uh, you know, in 50 years' time uh, on that uh, trans-bearing uh, uh, high-speed train if the Chinese do take those plans forward. But what that suggests is we've sort of had uh, a, a divergence. Um, in North America, uh, we've changed our rail infrastructure to meet the needs of for-profit, very successful long-haul, heavy-haul uh, freight operations, while Asia and Europe have been perfecting ever more higher speed, more, more uh, specialized uh, technology to move passengers. Uh, and these really are different engineering uh, pieces of, uh, of infrastructure. Now, some people, maybe some of you will say, well, that's great, you know, uh, um, it's like uh, some are from Mars and some are from Venus. Why not just have uh, them both go their separate ways? Uh, I think there's reasons why we may want to try and reconnect uh, the, uh, the future lessons and maybe also for China to learn how to do um, some of the freight uh, options uh, better. Um, but uh, the lessons uh, uh, are going to be sort of developed here in California. If we are going to figure out how to reconcile um, modern passenger trains with uh, the freight uh, uh, directions that North America has gone in, it's going to happen in this state. For, uh, since 2008, it's the first time that both a state 
and the national government have been committed to, in a major way, planning some sort of modern alternative uh, passenger train. Remember, in the mid-60s, when President Johnson set up uh, his demonstration program, uh, that was just a federal initiative. And then when Amtrak came along, that became the focus in Congress, whether to keep Amtrak or get rid of it, and there was never any time or money left over to talk about anything else, really. And then it was up to states like California to sort of figure out more local uh, options and initiatives. Uh, whether you uh, are voted for it or not, uh, Proposition 1A, the uh, high-speed rail bond measure in 2008, and the election of the uh, Obama administration put modern passenger trains on both the national and the state government's uh, agendas for the first time, really, uh, in a very long time. Even those land grants in the 19th century were federal-only initiatives. So we really haven't had Unlike roads or transit or airports where it's always been a federal state uh, a team working on these transportation developments, this is really the first time since 2008 where you've had both levels of government engaged. And California has been the most engaged uh, uh, of all. Um, so uh, it took four years to hammer out the financial uh, uh, negotiations and they're still legal issues and all sorts of uh, contention about this. But at least um, one milestone here is that for the first time, there's been a, a, a commitment between the feds and uh, California to split the cost of America's uh, uh, proposed first uh, real new um, passenger rail track, the uh, uh, line between Merced and, uh, and Bakersfield uh, in, in California. And that's a, uh, the original 1916 highway um, uh, assistance program was a 50-50 split between Washington and state governments. And now we've got in 2012 sort of a, almost there a 55 state level and a 45% uh, federal cost sharing of that uh, initial investment. And there's the, uh, uh, the line. And uh, of course, uh, San Jose isn't on this one, but we've got uh, Gilroy nearby. Uh, where the high-speed uh, line will eventually reach uh, to get to the Bay Area after this initial trunk line is, uh, is set. This is starting to look a lot like that blended rail model that uh, the Europeans used to develop high-speed rail. Originally, when the Prop 1A bond was passed, I think the model was more an exclusive corridor like the Japanese uh, pioneered, and there's some people who are busy suing everyone and uh, fighting that they still think that's the way to go and uh, it's been a betrayal. But um, the, uh, uh, the point is that all three work. Um, you know, uh, uh, the, the, the mega model that the Chinese have, the blended model that the Europeans have developed, and the, uh, the Japanese corridor model each have their, their um, potential. The good news, or the news for uh, Santa Cruz County, is that having a blended network, uh, which is where California seems to go, where there's going to be sharing of track up into the Bay Area from Gilroy up uh, to the Trans Bay Terminal, that leaves opportunities for connectivity and uh, uh, we're going to have to learn lessons on how to share, uh, to share with regional trains like the Caltrain, to share with the, maybe not tracks, uh, but at least corridors. Is it possible, for example, to expand an existing freight rail corridor rather than blast a brand new corridor through green fields or through other people's fields? Uh, there's already plenty of people in the Central Valley who don't like the uh, uh, new alignments that are being built. So there's going to be more uh, lessons and uh, experimentation trying to negotiate ways to share uh, what's, what's already um, available or in place, uh, I think. Um, and I think that, that, I, that I'm very excited that, you know, it's California that's going to uh, invent the uh, missing links to make this uh, new model railroad, as I call it. It sounds like a, a Christmas train set or something, but uh, uh, that's what it's going to be if it works. Uh, it'll be a model that other, others will want to copy. Um, California's uh, first high-speed rail corridor will trigger uh, a stampede, maybe within the state, uh, maybe with other states, all trying to uh, connect into this and replicate it if it uh, works. And I think Santa Cruz County uh, is just one sort of uh, uh, county removed from uh, being connected into this, uh, this very 
um, transformative piece of infrastructure. So connecting the tracks you have here with this new model railroad could pay very big dividends. Uh, the a term that seemed to get everyone's attention this morning at the regional board meeting was leverage. I mean, here you have billions of dollars of federal and state money that's going to be spent to build this, you know, corridor that can get people from the Central Valley to Silicon Valley in an hour or so, uh, under two hours, certainly. Um, that's going to be transformative. You know, all those uh, people who are priced out of working uh, in the Silicon Valley because they can't afford to live there and can't get there, uh, even from here, it's uh, getting tough. Um, you know, all of a sudden, uh, places like Fresno and uh, Merced and Modesto um, that have not, have sort of been left behind by the economic uh, growth on the coast of California will be plugged in. And uh, uh, some people probably spend more time trying to get from one part of Silicon Valley to the other than people who are able, who may be able to uh, commute on this new uh, high-speed rail uh, network in 20 years' time. That's going to be transformative and will open up, I mean, if Silicon Valley has a sort of a price cap on how much it can do and how much it can develop in the high-tech sector just because of the cost of living there, this will sort of uh, take that cap off of it, and um, being connected to that would be very powerful. So you could have local trains connecting in. These are uh, pictures from uh, uh, France and Germany in those blended networks where you have regional trains that show up at places like Gilroy, whatever, these are French and German towns of that type, um, and they pull up on one track and the high-speed rail pulls up on the other and people have a quick connection uh, between them. Here, I'll, I'll sort of close with uh, showing that you can have a single track branch line, just like in this county, that's used actually by a high speed rail. This is uh, uh, the T TGV that runs to Chambéry in the uh, pre-Alps, as the French call them. It's sort of uh, the foothills of, uh, of the Alps. Uh, Chambéry has a, a population that's actually just a little bit smaller than uh, the city of Santa Cruz, at least according to uh, Google when I looked it up. The density is a lot higher. Um, uh, they've built, uh, you can see the, the land use there, the homes near the tracks and higher rise buildings uh, in the background. So it might be a, a, a different density, but it's not that uh, big a stretch to imagine a train that could come down uh, at least uh, some part of your line, then get over to Gilroy or some other junction point uh, with uh, the uh, California high speed rail and then blast off to get you uh, to uh, 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 Southern California or uh, to uh, uh, the Bay Area very quickly uh, in the future. Not recommending that that's what you should do, it's just to suggest that it's one of the options that could and should be uh, on the table for your long-term uh, options uh, uh, for consideration. It's definitely within the realm of possibility. That's part of the lessons that we can learn from other parts of the world. And uh, if you want to read more uh, about uh, energy first transportation planning, which was the model we put forward in our uh, book uh, that I wrote with Richard Gilbert, that's the uh, book. I'm sure you can check it out uh, of your library here or uh, get it uh, over the web. And I'd be uh, happy to uh, talk with you about uh, the issues that are on your mind after hearing these ideas. Thanks very much.